This week on Quality Digest Live, we chat with Chad Keimel of Omnex Systems about harmonizing approaches to FMEA. That's right. Plus, uh, is more break time the key to better productivity in 2018? I hope so. <laughs> Me too. In fact, I think I'll take a break now. <laughs> we'll find out when we come back. This week's sponsor of Quality Digest Live is Olympus, specializing in easy to use digital microscope solutions that provide the measurements and images you need. And welcome back to Quality Digest Live for December 15th, 2017. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Mike Richman, publisher of Quality Digest. And I'm Quality Digest Editor-in-Chief, Dirk Ducharme. So currently, if you were listening to our tease a few minutes ago, if you are a supplier, of automotive products to both German and North American automakers, you must assess your products, failure modes, and effects differently. Uh, one set of rules for AIAG and another one for uh, VDA. Uh, and this is because there's a difference in the FEA manuals or the processes between the VDA, that's the German Association of Automotive Industry, and the Automotive Industry Action Group, the AIG, here in the United States, was kind of the VDA's counterpart. So this, the, the idea that you have two different manuals for two different agencies, let's say, adds complexity and extra work for automotive industry suppliers. So to address that problem, the AIAG and VDA have developed a harmonized FMEA manual, the draft of which has uh, just been released. And according to FDA and AIG, a common set of FMEA re requirements will enable suppliers to have a single FMEA business process and associated methods and tools to produce a robust, accurate, and complete FMEA that would meet the needs of all of their customers. So this is an important development for suppliers, and here to tell us more about it is Chad Keimel, CTO and founder of Omnex. Hi, Chad. Hi, Dirk. How are you? Pretty good. I should say that Chad's uh, joining us via phone today, not mm -hmm. Skype. So. Uh, we won't get to see him live, but we'll get to listen to him. So, uh, Chad, uh, set the stage here a little bit. Uh, U.S. automakers and German automakers use a different FMEA, FMEA process, right? This is uh, a process that's documented for each of them, so they each have kind of their own, what, FMEA playbook, so to speak? Why, why is that a problem? Well, Dirk, <clears throat> you know, I mean, when you look at it, you could say Honda has a different format. GM has a different format, and what you know, you know, as as people who supply software actually for FMEA, we're able to easily bridge the gap between, let's say, Honda and 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 uh, um, GM or the AIAG FMEA, but the VDA FMEA is significantly different. So much so that you know it's it's. You know, you have to make dramatic changes in the in the format of the FMEA. Uh, so I'll just say it like this: it's a it's a lot of extra work to do AIAG and VDA. You know, if customers ask ask it, and customers do. Second problem that I you know that everybody faced and for the large companies is that German parts of the of the organization was following a different format, believed in a different format than the you know, the rest of the world, I'll say. So that was also a big problem in terms of methodologies. So Jack, can so, you... Maybe, like that. Can, can you maybe drill down into this a bit more for us and, and maybe give us a key way or two that uh, the FMEA manuals, uh, US and, and, and the VDA differ and, and what those differences cause? Absolutely. You know, and I'll, I'll, I'll look at the DFMEA and then I'll give you a PFMEA. In the DFMEA, the, the U.S. looks at, so, you know, when you look at these, the products, you can say there's a system. A system may have a subsystem. A subsystem may have components. So you have it's sort of like the way the bill of materials uh, break down. When you do a VDA, FMEA, you're looking at all three levels of the product at the same time. 
And they, when you look at the failure mode, let's say you're focusing on the subsystem, they look at the failure at the, at the system level and say that's the effect. And they look at a failure at the component level and they say that's the cause. So they look at all three levels simultaneously. The Americans will look at any one of the levels and say, how can I just improve this level? That and, makes any sense. Yeah, and, and is is one of those better than another? I mean, is is kind of the the American way of doing that? Is 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 that more valuable than the than the the German way of doing it, or is there, or is there value in both of those? You know, um, I don't want to give a quick answer. I think each of those has you know benefits to it, and uh, so really the harmonized method you know, should have married the two. And uh, that's, that's, so that's the, you know, uh, advantage of, of integration, integrating both the methods. Well, tell us a little bit then about, about the new Harmonized Manual and what it's trying to accomplish and, and maybe some, some of the highlights that, that might be, let's say, most valuable to people, to, to suppliers. All right, so when you look at the Harmonized Manual, number one, you know, there is a six-step process for creating both DFMEs and PFMEs, so that's one. Second is, we have adopted in the DFMEA looking at all three levels simultaneously, okay? So which makes it, so we think the competency requirements of people who know FMEAs have to go up a notch. Second is, um, you, you're going to, you may involve three levels of the supply chain at the same time, if you can imagine that, right? A lot of times when we work with uh, customers, we find they just know their product. They don't know as much about the product uh, you know, that it goes into, and they certainly don't know as much about the, uh, about the component, or the component supply, or vice versa. So here, we're going to have to bring in not only the customer, we also have to bring in the supplier in being able to do a good FMEA. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. And, uh, the, the, you know, I, on one big, other big change for the Germans, for example, they're not used to the idea of recommended actions the way the Americans had it. And so we're adding recommended actions and the recommended actions would go on the right-hand side of the FMEA, which they didn't do before. And the, and the, um, the uh, FMEAs now are very clearly delineating recommended actions which are preventive in nature and detective in nature, and they're including putting in a link for where, you know, so the objective evidence of what has changed right into the FMEA. So very interesting, you know, changes coming into place and with the with the help of you know all the people listening in companies uh, organizations like omnex we're going to absolutely try to make sure the best you know uh, methodology is adopted by the you know automotive industry now we, and we, you know the pay, yeah we, we, Go we ahead, that the, the draft version uh, I, the, the draft version of this is is out is that correct the draft is out. It's in a commenting period. Okay. I encourage the listener, listeners to go and take a look at it. Of course, we're going to be adding a lot more insight into all the things I talked about in the webinar we're doing together uh, next week. That's right. So I, digest. Yep. And, and I, one more thing, Dirk, I want to make sure people know. <laughs> American cars are doing very, very well. You know, I put that TGW, uh, J.D. Power's findings into the article I wrote for you guys. And um, I find people don't know that. They don't know for two years in a row, the American car makers have outpaced the Japanese in terms of TGW and the J.D. Power's ratings. So these things don't happen accidentally. And I especially put that into the FMEA dialogue to say, hey, Things are improving, all the hard work is paying off, and things will, and I'm, you know, I, one of your speakers is gonna be talking about electronics and software in cars. And uh, I have to say, that's the way I see the evolution of the FMEA trying to help. 
And as at Omnex, we're going to be doing some additional webinars. And, and, and one of the ones, one of the, we're planning three webinars, uh, Dirk and Mike. And the third one is going to be taking a critical analysis in terms of the changes that are happening in the, uh, in the car and why it's important to adopt you know, these, these types of methodologies we are trying to adopt. That's right, and as, as Chad uh, has mentioned here, we do have a webinar coming up on this. So if you're interested in learning more about uh, the, the topic, uh, the, the new uh, harmonized FMEA, we and Omnex Systems are presenting a webinar next week called the new AIAG VDA FMEA. The webinar happens next week on Tuesday, December 19th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, and uh, Chad here, who we just spoke with will be your presenter and I'm hosting, so keep an eye on your email inbox for an invitation, or um, if you're on our website right now, there's a mm -hmm. link right underneath the player page that links out to the registration page, so click on that and register. It's uh, Chad's uh, webinars are always cram-packed full of information, oh, yeah. <laughs> so you want, to, uh, you want to tune in for that. So uh, Chad, thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you, guys. All right, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye now. See okay, you, so Chad. On. Thanks again, Chad. Yes, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Dirk, uh, Chad's webinars are always very packed. Yep. Got a little taste of it there. If you haven't checked out a, an Omnex webinar, definitely check the one out on Tuesday. All right, so you say you need to get more done next year, 2018 <laughs> coming up. Yep. Uh, so then this next story should be right up your alley. Want to be more productive in 2018? Take more breaks yes. is the name of this piece, which That's comes to us. From sleep more. The, uh, <laughs> sleep more, work less, worry less. There you go. Uh, what well, comes to us from MIT Sloan, ex Sloan's executive education blog. I think it's Innovation at Work is their, the name of their blog. Uh, the piece asks us to consider the, the somewhat, I think you can say it's probably the counterintuitive notion that you can actually get more accomplished by taking frequent breaks and mixing up the type of work you do rather than just kind of slugging your way through a, a single task for hours on end, which is what many of us yeah, and it gets mind -numbing. seem to want to do. Yep. It gets mind-numbing. It yep. seems like you want to feel like you're productive, and that's what many people feel like is you're productive is sitting there and just hammering away at something, but yeah. maybe not so much because according to, to various bits of research cited in the article, the average person gets the best results when she or he hyper-focuses on a task for anywhere from, from 52 to 90 minutes, that's the range of a couple of different studies. Okay. Um, and that takes a 15 to 17 minute, again, there's this range here, 15 to 17 minute break to mentally consolidate the knowledge gained from the work that you've been doing in that task. And that break should ideally be something totally different from the type of work you were doing while you were engaged. In, in other words, if you were doing online research or fact checking, don't spend your break checking your Facebook page or your fantasy football team, right? I mean, <laughs> that really isn't gonna recharge you. Instead, for maximum energy and, and brain recharging benefit, take a quick walk with your boss to do some long range planning. Maybe or grab a cup of coffee with someone that you're mentoring. It, it's kind of like weightlifting, and this is my own analogy, I didn't mention this in the article, but I thought about this when I read it. Um, you know, you get a lot more benefit out of what they call shocking your muscles by doing you know, vastly different types of exercises at varying levels of intensity at different times in your workout routine. So if you take frequent breaks and you do different things, it kind of shocks your brain in the same way and kind of wakes you up and makes sure that you're really attentive to what you're doing. According to uh, Bob Posen, who's an MIT Sloan senior lecturer and author of the best-selling book, Extreme Productivity, Boost Your Results, Reduce Your Hours, Different times of the day demand different kinds of breaks. I mean, in the morning, for instance, you, you might want to take mellow breaks, like maybe a quick meditation or chatting with a friend. In the afternoon, however, uh, as Posen says, quote, our body energy goes down and a break can re-energize you. So, good food for thought there. The key takeaway here is that hours worked and productivity achieved are not necessarily one and the same. As Posen says, we need to do away with time as a success metric. And that's good advice. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. rather than say, well, I did 60 hours of work this week. Well, okay, maybe you did. I mean, how much was productive because you were 30% of the time you were like not focused right, and you were right. just slamming through. It's good food for thought. I mean, yeah. I, I certainly know we're here in our little organization, many of us have our tasks that we really focus on, and, and maybe there's better ways of doing it. You know, yeah. mix it up a little bit. Yeah, well, I know, you know, I mean, like, like you said, you know, just taking a break, going for a walk. It's interesting what he, what he points out yep. that a break is not doing the same kind of activity, but different. So going on Facebook during your break when you've been sitting in front of your computer all morning. Doesn't help. It, it may seem like you're doing something relaxing, but you're your brain is still having to do the same thing. It's looking at a screen, recording, you know, reading 
you know, letters and words and then having to compute them, right? So, I mean, it's, it's really the same activity. And, you know, I mean, from a mind-body, uh, you know, unity perspective, I mean, you know, they say, you know, you really shouldn't sit. Yeah, you need to get off your For very long. You butt. need to get up. I mean, <laughs> right. and, you know, literally just five-minute walk to another person's office, and, you know, it can feel like you're wasting time. Yeah. But you're really not. You're engaging maybe in, hey, what are you working on? What's, what's you know, do you have any issues that I can help out with? Or just, you know, BSing. I mean, it's fine. Yeah. I mean, it, it helps to keep your brain limber and doing your thing. It helps your body too. So that's yeah. all really good stuff. So cool. good, good advice there from MIT Sloan School of Business. All right. All right. Well, now it's time for CMS Corner. This is our, our monthly segment in which we, we chat with various thought leaders in the field of port, portable coordinate metrology. The Coordinate Metrology Society, the CMS, is the member-based organization in this space, and they present the best hardware, software, and peripherals at their annual conference, the, the CMSC, the Coordinate Metrology Society Conference, uh, that happens each and every July. CMSC 2018 is going to take place in Reno, Nevada from July 23rd to the 27th this coming summer, and Quality Digest, of course, we're proud to serve as the media partner for this great society. We've held that role for 12 years now. Mm -hmm. Wow, you know, long time. Yep. 12 year media partner, very proud of that the work we've done with the Accord Metrology Society. So on today's CMS, CMS Corner, we're interviewing one of those folks that really makes the Accord Metrology Society run well. That's Vice Chair Scott Sandwith. And Scott works closely with those that present white papers at each year's conference. And for his day job, he serves as Custom Projects Manager for New, New River Kinematics. Many of you know them as the makers of spatial analyzer software. So Scott Sandwith, welcome back to CMS Corner. Thank you. How are you today, Scott? I'm uh, I'm doing really well. I appreciate the chance, uh, Mike and Dirk, to to be with you today, and uh, also want to acknowledge, just as you suggested, that your team's effort with the CMS uh, to help us continue to expand our metrology um, solutions to our members. We, oh, sure. we appreciate that. It's been it really been, it's been our great pleasure. organization. Yep. It has been since 2005. It's been our great pleasure. Well, as mentioned, you specialize. You yourself specialize in, in the presentations that are, you know, really such a great big part of, of the CMSC experience for presenters and, and their audiences alike. So, how did you kind of first get involved with white papers? These presentations at, at CMSC. Uh, uh, I've actually had an amazing opportunity to work on some some incredible projects um, with New River Kinematics. And uh, I actually started my, this journey um, with Boeing MRD's optics group. And I had the chance to work with photogrammetry, uh, theodolites, total stations, even laser radar to help introduce those to help build airplane parts and tools most, more effectively. I was then able to take that work and put it into a presentation and a technical paper and then present it at the conference. And uh, that felt great to both learn from other metrologists and some of their techniques, but also then present some of the crafty techniques and solutions that we uh, we were able to deploy into the shop. And uh, you, Scott, if you can just tell us a little bit about more, <coughs> excuse me, about the uh, the call for papers. I, I believe the call for papers for. CMSC 2018 was just issued, if I remember that right. And so, can you explain to us? what that means and where the process goes from here for those interested in presenting at the show in, uh, in Reno this summer. Oh, um, absolutely. So that, uh, that call for papers is really a notice that uh, to our metrology members, uh, like those listening today, that uh, on how to put together a presentation and paper to explore those different 3D metrology uh, solutions and how these processes affect the productivity and uh, the user experience. Basically, they present test results and uh, along with the solutions how and why. And at this point in the process, our technical presentations committee is really looking forward to getting an abstract, which is the first step in the process. And that abstract basically summarizes the work. It takes a look at what the test results are and then draws some conclusions. Uh, that were achieved on that project. So that's what the abstract is for, and the call for papers is really that first step in the process. It's asking for an abstract that can be submitted by the by the author or authors. And, and now, Scott, there's a really as a wide range. We've seen it of papers that are presented at the show each year. I mean, from those in industry as well as academia. 
uh, it covers pretty much every piece of equipment and application one could think of within close tolerance large volume measurement. What are your favorite types of papers? What are some of the favorite types of papers that you've seen over the years and what have you learned from them in your career? Uh, that's a great question. And your suggestion that we get a wide range of topics every year is spot on. So last year we had a presentation by a, a, a Triumph engineer about how to take individual airplane component, airplane wings and put together the very best optimum airplane wing assemblies. And then we also had a presentation from NASA on photogrammetry in space. Come on, how cool is that? <laughs> then we had a series of presentations on a brand new telescope that's being deployed in Chile. That was cool. Called the LSST. And that new telescope um, is going to help change how we see the world. It's going to put together movies. Instead of that classic single image of a galaxy or, uh, or the universe, um, it's going to put together a movie about how the night sky changes every night. But uh, all of these applications really depend upon uh, metrology and how it's being used. And so I could go on and on and on about this. Uh, but we're going to save some of those topics for next year's conference. Perfect. Well, you, you are vice chair, as I mentioned in, in our intro here uh, for the CMS uh, this year right now. Uh, you're going to be stepping into the big chair itself in July at the end of CMSC 2018. You will officially be the chair of this organization. So what, is the, what do you see personally as some of the challenges, maybe opportunities that you're going to have uh, in that role? Uh, I am really excited uh, to continue my work with uh, the, um, uh, the CMSC's executive committee and our mission to enhance the use of 3D metrology in industry today. So our, our current chairman, Gary Confalone from East Coast Metrology and our past chair, Keith Bevan from the National Physical Laboratory in the UK, they've been working to expand the CMSC's community by introducing a, a focus on laser scanning applications and traditional CMMs, which is a big step for us. And, um, and in that, uh, we're gonna try to expand out with uh, offering new certification exams for CMM operators, like uh, for a pilot for uh, 3D scanner operators and, uh, and for just traditional CMM operators. And that's on top of the certification uh, uh, tests that we have for uh, portable CMM operators and, um, and uh, laser tracker professionals. So my work and effort and energy is gonna try to build on that, um, that uh, amazing work that's uh, been ongoing now for some time with our exist with our current uh, leadership. Well, Scott Sandwith, it's great work the organization does. It's www.cmsc.org for all of you out there who, who'd like to learn more about it, perhaps attend the conference in Reno this summer. Uh, Scott, we will see you in Reno, of course, in July again. Uh, we'll see you before then. I think uh, we have a schedule for another CMS corner between now and then, so we'll see you again on the show. Uh, right. But uh, thanks so much. Have a great holiday season, and we'll, uh, we'll see you soon. A hey, Merry Christmas from hey, Seattle. Hey, and, Scott. Uh, and in particular today, may the force be with you. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Heading soon to a theater, theater all around us. Yeah, a galaxy <laughs> far, far away. Thank you again, Scott. Right. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. We'll see you again. See you, <laughs> see you Scott. Bye. <laughs> all right. Well, now it's time we're going to move right along to, for our tech corner. Uh, once again, we're happy to have uh, Robert Bellinger, who's the product applications manager. Uh, of industrial microscopes for Olympus America in our studio, showing off Olympus's Lext OLS 5000 laser confocal microscope, which is a non-contact, non-destructive 3D microscope. So guys, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, and so Rob, like uh, Mike said, we got a new microscope. This is a brand new microscope? We, yes, this is our brand new version of the Lex. This is the model OLS 5000. It's our laser scanning confocal microscope, like you said. Um, some new features and advances in this system, kind of groundbreaking. Um, First off, they increase the speed quite a bit in this new system, uh, four times faster, so you're able to get your images and data quicker and scan around samples at much faster speeds. Um, with that speed, they also increased resolution, so we're down in the uh, single nanometer range for oh. yeah, Z okay. resolution, still capable of very high magnifications, up to 18,000 times magnification. Is di digital magnif so magnification or both optical and digital? This or? is going to be optical magnification really? using okay. the laser, yeah. Okay. Right. Um, and then it comes down to the optics itself. The uh, Lext has dedicated objectives since we're an optics company. We have a whole new line of objectives for this system. 
uh, some long working distance objectives that are designed specifically for the 405 nanometer laser. Okay. So what that gives us is the ability to have more accuracy in our measurements across our entire field of view and use a broader range of objective lens options and guarantee and back those measurement values. So on top of all that hardware changes, they also improve software. It's a ground up software now, uh, redesign for simplified use and a little more powerful measurement capabilities and some uh, automation kind of built into it as well. So okay. I can show some of the yeah, software stuff. For yeah. sure. So to begin with, you know, we also have white light imaging on this system, so it can do both laser and color imaging. Um, so we usually start in the white light, and with the motorized stage option, we can create in the software now maps very quickly. And this map screen does a quick scan around of your sample. So if you have a large part, but you're going to be working at it high magnifications, you might want to create a map of it so you can move to different locations quickly. Okay, so what it was just doing so, is is scanning and stitching together. And stitching together okay. just a quick overview map of your sample okay. that you put under there. And you could keep going and stitch a larger area depending on the size of the sample you have. And this map is now your stage control. So if I want to move to a specific location, all I have to do is double click on that location and it'll move right to it. And so this uses kind of a navigation. This is the navigation, okay. and in this map, we can also set up to do stitching areas. Okay. So not only can we acquire a 3D image in a single frame of view, which I'll show today, but for time constraints, uh, we won't show all the stitching okay. capabilities, but it's able to set up a stitching map on this image and go to all those fields and automatically capture the 3D data, the okay. color image, and create one entire 3D image at, that you at can... A higher, at a higher resolution. At a much higher resolution. Okay, so right now, it. we do the stitch at the low mag at our 5X objective, yep, but we can magnify in quickly to, say, our 20X objective, which now incorporates our Lex dedicated objective, and it does a quick autofocus to find the best focus point on our sample for us. And as I scroll through on the mouse here, this is just the live color image. I can kind of see where I'm located make sure I'm on the right part that I want to inspect. And everything else beyond that is going to be automated in this new software. So okay. really, it's just this big start button down here on the screen. So you, you define, I, I missed, you so. define the start and the stop Don't, for the Z, or, or it's going to do it on itself? This one's going to do it automatically okay. with a set in the auto feature. We still can go in and do a manual one for okay. very specific needs, but okay. 90, over 90% 90 of the samples, the auto is going to work. When I push this button now, and the software is going to do a smart scan. So you'll see it go through and capture a quick scan. It sets the bottom top of our focus, and okay. it's also setting the brightness. Now what it's doing is scanning through our image, all the different pla platforms of focus, oh, okay. and building a three-dimensional image that we can actually interact with during the scan here. Zoom in and out. And as it builds this, you can see the sample come together. After this is done, it'll go back through and use the white light, since I have it selected to capture a color image as well. Uh, and it'll build okay. all of our focus points for color. So then we can take a high resolution laser image and overlay our color images on top. So if you're looking for, is that a gold pad or is that a, a metal plate at the bottom? Okay. You might know, rather than, you know, laser image is all grayscale but a color image will tell us where maybe our gold contacts so, are. So if we, if we can go to the screenshot here, so, uh, Noah. So this is, this is, an, oh, this is the, the color scan, or is this the this is, overlay of both? This is the 3D height data that it captured okay. during the scan, okay. and it overlays the color image on top of, on it. Top of it. Okay, so you got both there. Yeah. Okay, so gotcha. this, this image here is the raw height data just in a color scheme, okay. and this is the raw height points plotted. And the top image here is what the laser uh, would see okay, back, the okay. grayscale the laser intensity image. And, and the bottom is those combined? And the bottom is just the height data combined with the color. With the image. color, okay, yeah. okay, gotcha, gotcha. So cool. this is real quick. It auto saves our images for us, and the user is going to then go analyze the image once they have it set. When I do that, it'll open up a separate software for analysis. Now that software you could be doing measurements on and then go back to the acqui acquiring software, the data acquisition software, and go get another image while you're doing measurements or doing okay. things over here. Okay. So when it drops our image into here, it shows the 3D image again, and this is our color image. We can also see the map image. But what this whole layout is is a template 
that can be customized. And this is where some of the measurement repeatability comes in between users. If you want a user to always do a step measurement on the sample or a roughness measurement on that sample, you can have a predefined template for that sample. Right. So right when the image drops in, it's dropped into the template where we have on this one a profile measurement. So as a profile goes across, I'll actually double click on this to open the, the view. We can plot profile lines wherever we want, predefine those in the template, and as I move, you can see the profile change in the bottom of the screen here. And on this profile, what we're doing is a height measurement between the two different steps. Um, you want to know how far down the, this is actually a solder bump that's been right. removed, so how far down is penetrating into the circuit. And they can add more lines, they can take more measurements, do width measurements in here, any kind of critical dimensional measurement on the surface. And out in the software program here, we have all of our measurement results. So we get our height measurements, our profile line drawn. We can even plot 3D images on a second page. So all of these are multiple pages that then can be saved as PDF or Excel documents. Now, if, if I understand, well, one of the real strengths, uh, or one of the big strengths of, of, of this product is uh, sur sur surface roughness? So that's one of the major components to the software, and it's a surface metrology tool. Okay. So not only just volume measurements and step heights, we want to know surface wear analysis. So we can then go to line roughness profile measurements. So plotting a line somewhere on the sample image here, any location you want, we can set up to do roughness analysis across that line. So if you're looking at a groove or a wear analysis of something, you can plot a single line point across that and that gives you your roughness average measurements or your root mean squareds. Okay. And you can even get all the information out of like your waviness profile, your load curves, and all that information. Okay. So all this gets exported out into that same report document. Beyond just line roughness though, since we have an entire 3D area, we can do area roughness as well. So we can take an average around an entire okay. area. On this one, I've selected a region of interest on the sample here, on this one level here and we were able to get area roughness measurements. And that gives us you know, surface area averages, and it's very quick because you've already got all the 3D data there, you just need to specify the region, and it gets all the data oh, for cool. you. You don't have to scan multiple lines. Right. And like I said, all of this template is customized. If these are the measurements you want to perform each time, right when the image drops in, all those measurement tabs are there. The most the operator might have to do is generate a new region of interest or something like that. Okay. And then everything exports out to Excel or to PDF documents for the measurement outputting. Um, and like I said, as we're doing our measurements here, we could have went back to the data acquisition software and been capturing images. Sometimes we'll set this up with dual monitors to improve your workflow. Right. Now, uh, I, I think you wanted to point out something uh, about the, ob uh, the objectives or yeah, like I said at the beginning, we have a, a new 10x objective, new long working distance objectives, a total of six dedicated objectives now for this microscope. Okay. So using the laser wavelength, we want to make sure it's optically corrected for that wavelength. So all of our measurements are repeatable and accurate through the entire field of view, even in a stitched image now. Right. So we can guarantee our measurements on this tool. So being an optics company, we don't just use off-the-shelf optics, we make the optics for this metrology system, and, and we're one of the only ones to do that. What, what markets are, are, is basically this intended for? Yeah, it has a broad range. Um, obviously, you know, like a circuitry chip like this, semiconductor markets for quality assurance or maybe even failure analysis, um, through to, you know, um, metals, any kind of metal manufacturing, bearings and uh, valve manufacturers, and then it's moving into the automotive market as well. There's a lot of demand for the automotive market looking at wear analysis mm. and engines and transmissions. But like we mentioned earlier in the show, the electronics part of the automotive is really starting to blend in now. We're seeing a lot of electronic uh, uh, merging in the automotive market and a lot of electronic imaging and uh, failure analysis and quality right, testing okay. done with this kind of tool. So everything from your smart cars now and looking at batteries to the sensors and the variable valve timing sensors and engines, they're getting super technolo tech technology technology. And is this, is, this the, is this the only size, uh, volume? No, I'm glad you asked that. This is actually our small frame okay. with a uh, motorized stage. We have a large 12-inch 
uh, frame system as well for a 300 millimeter, almost you can fit large wafers onto that system. Mm -hmm. And then there's also a larger frame extension for this for very tall samples. They have a larger platform that can fit up to um, you know, 300 millimeter uh, tall samples for bulk stuff that you have to put on, maybe an entire piston. Mm -hmm. Assembly needs to be sat under there for measurement at the surface. So there's an extension platform for that. And there's also the ability to hook this into gantry systems and such. Okay, terrific. Yeah. Uh, so Rob, this was the OLS 5000, right? The OLS 5000. And there, there, is a, there is a link to this. Uh, on, underneath the player page, there is a link that I believe goes out to the product data page for Great. for this. So uh, if you've got one more information, you can, you can go out there and look at it. Yeah, please. Okay, Rob, well, thanks. Thank you very Appreciate much, Dirk. Okay, thank back you. to you, Mike. Well, there you go. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Dirk. That is the Lext OLS 5000 from Olympus, a laser confocal microscope. Good job, Dirk, as, as always yeah, on the awesome. tech corner. Fun product. Good, good job. Good job by Rob Bellinger as well. Always These things just keep more ah, and more accurate and fast. It's, it's <laughs> like... It's yeah, crazy. It's crazy Rob, Rob's done a few of these for us now. He does a great <laughs> right. job. All right, well, that's our show for this week. But before we go, we want to thank our sponsor. Guess who that is? The Vanta XRF Analyzer from Olympus provides fast, accurate elemental analyses when screening for lead, arsenic, mercury, and other toxic metals in consumer products like toys, uh, apparel, and electronics to help support compliance with Rojas requirements. Uh, other Olympus technologies include ultrasonic flaw detectors and thickness gauges. Videoscopes, boroscopes, industrial microscopes, microscopes. as we just saw, uh, advanced non-destructive testing systems, and a large selection of industrial scanners, probes, software programs, and instrument accessories. So for more information, visit www.olympus-ims.com or click on the banner right just below or just to the right of this video player screen. That's right, and don't forget that we have a webinar coming up for you uh, this coming week titled mm -hmm. The New AIAG VDA FMEA. <laughs> so a whole string of acronyms there. Right. Uh, it happens next week on Tuesday, September 19th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, and Chad Keimel of Omnic Systems is presenting. I'll be your host, so keep an eye on your email inbox for your invitation to this event. Well, that's right, and we want to thank Chad Kimel, of course, for yep, joining for us on the show earlier today. Yep. Uh, Rob Bellinger for coming down and joining us here in the studio. Of course, we don't want to forget about Scott Sandwith of the According Metrology Society and New River Kinematics for coming on via Skype as well. Action-packed show for you today. And this was the last one of the year, so hey, Merry uh, Christmas. thank you all for having a, sticking with us for the whole year that's again. Right. We'll be back at you for our, uh, it's going to be our seventh year next year. <laughs> Of Quality Digest Live next year. Seven years of fun. Seven year itch, hopefully not, but we'll uh, scratch it right now. But uh, yeah, no, we'll be back at you on January 5th, I think is the first show of the new year. So uh, mark your calendars now, come back and join us then. You all have a great holiday season. Merry right. Christmas, Happy New Year, Dirk. Happy Hanukkah. Everything, <laughs> thank you to you as well. We'll see you next year. So long guys. Bye.